Man, I could run through a wall right now. <laughs> um, yes, that is my wife. I do not know how I got so lucky. I am aware that I have outkicked my coverage. Um, you do not have to tell me, um, but man, you're cute. You got it. I know that's not your forte, but man, you look good doing it. Um, if you got your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and turn with me, or maybe on a smart device, swipe with me too. Um, we're going to be in the New Testament today, uh, in the book of Acts. So we'll get past the, the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so the fifth book in the New Testament is the book of Acts. The reason it's called Acts is because it tells of the Acts of the early church, like when Jesus ascended into heaven and then the early church was established here on the earth. It's, it's a lot of stories, really, a narrative about how the church was established and, and which set the stage for us to continue that today. Like we are a direct result. This gathering here this morning is a direct result of what happened thousands of years ago in that book. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 4, um, and we're going to land there momentarily. Um, there is, uh, there's kind of a, a buzz word or a buzz phrase um, that has kind of picked up steam here of late. Really, um, kind of, it's, it's, you know, within the past five years, but then here even more recently, it's kind of become, uh, you know, more, more at the forefront, something that we hear that we talk about a lot, and it's this term, cancel culture, cancel culture. And if you're not familiar with cancel culture, um, let me give you kind of a brief definition of it. it, it cancel culture refers to, the popular practice of withdrawing support for or canceling public figures and companies after they have done or said something that is considered objectionable or offensive. Cancel culture is generally discussed as being performed on social media in the form of group shaming. And so um, particularly, it kind of started on Twitter, and it's now um, it kind of spilled out into other forms of social media. It's where we see the most prominent form of, of cancel culture. But someone would say something, it would be deemed offensive by the general public, and so they would then cancel that person just by like just putting them on blast. And in many cases, it would result in that person ending up like deleting their whole account and, and all of those things. And we're seeing now that cult, cancel culture is it, um, it, where it started out kind of in just mainstream culture. We're seeing it now seep down into the Christian community as well. And not just the public um, at large against the Christian community, but we're even seeing different sects and, and different, um, different groups within the realm of Christianity canceling other Christians. And it's gone so far that it's not just anymore. It's not public figures like celebrities and, and um, you know, well-known businesses and everything. It's even gotten to the level where it's affecting common everyday man like me, like you, like just you know, regular average folks. Um, the truth is that being a true Christian or Christ follower is no longer mainstream anymore. And I know that that's not, you know, brand new news to anyone that's sitting here today. Those of you that are watching with us online um, we, can, we can very easily see just by turning on the news, watching television, going out into the community in which we live, that, that those of us who proclaim to be and who are practicing actually living out our lives as true followers of Jesus Christ, we are being, uh, th there is an attempt being made to push us further and further and further into the fringes of American society. And how this ties into cancel culture is, I can give you a few examples. Um, for uh, and these three examples, by the way, the things that I'm going to say, I believe them with all my heart. Go ahead and cancel me if you want to. I don't care because I know that they're true. But it's stuff like life is sacred and it begins at conception and abortion is murder. It's got really heavy in here all of a sudden. We can't say things like that or we're not supposed to say things like that any, anymore because it's, it's her body and it's her choice, right? No. No, 
Marriage is a covenant recognized under God between one man and one woman only. We can't say things like that because then we marginalize or we ostracize the homosexual crowd who they want to be married to, but when we go back into the scriptures, we see that's not how it was designed and initiated by God. Here's a third example. There are two genders, two. The Bible says God created them male and female. There are two genders, not 37 or whatever number we're up to now. There are two genders, period. That's it. And we can't say those things. We're not supposed to say those things anymore because someone that believes differently than us, they might get their feelings hurt. We might upset them. And then that's not being very loving, very accepting. That's not being like Jesus because he was all about love, right? And that's what we've started to promote, particularly in this kind of woke Christianity that has risen to the surface here of late. But I, I, I've got news for you. Just because Jesus ate and associated with sinners doesn't mean that he condoned their sin. But somewhere along the line, some of us started to buy into the lie that in order for us to love people like Jesus did, it means that we have to tolerate evil and sin around us. Or that loving people like Jesus did means that we have to walk around on eggshells being very careful what we say or do because we certainly don't want to offend anyone. And sure, we can, we can claim to be Christians. We, we often do that. But, but I'm seeing more and more people claiming to be Christians only when it benefits them or when it fits their agenda or when it makes them feel good. And we've lost sight of what it means to, to truly follow after Jesus Christ and to live a life that honors him. And instead, what we are seeing in our society, in our culture, in America today at large is a wishy-washy Christianity that is quickly becoming the norm. And this is not catching anyone off guard. Paul said that it would be exactly like this. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Here's his words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. It culminates in in verse 5 there of 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul says, They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. And he says, stay away from people like that. Stay away from them. Those that claim to be godly, but deny the power that it affords them. And just a quick stat, what we're seeing, this is, this is just one statistic that is kind of telling of the transition that is taking place in our society that, that COVID-19 and this pandemic and everything has, has only accelerated the move in this direction. A recent Barna study shows us that about one third of practicing Christians, that's a key word there, practicing About one-third of practicing Christians, it's 32%, say that they have neither attended their pre-COVID church nor watched that church or any other church, for that matter, online since the pandemic began. Let me ask you a question. How can you be a practicing Christian but not participate in the thing that God 
initiated and he established on this earth. We read about it in the book of Acts and we've been charged, we've been called to to gather together in person, online. How can you be a practicing Christian but deny the very core thing that makes us who we are? It doesn't add up. And so today we're in part two of a series called Dangerous Prayers, which is inspired by Craig Groeschel's book of the same name. And it's based on the premise that overall, Christians, you and I, we we pray pretty safe prayers. Things like, Lord, bless me. Lord, protect me. Lord, be with me. You know, now I lay me down to sleep. God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. You know, those are the things that we pray, but what if we started to pray bigger, more faith-filled prayers? How might might choosing to pray bolder, more dangerous prayers, how might that change our hearts and our lives? How might it cause 2021 to be our best year yet. What if praying these kinds of prayers would cause us to experience the fullness of Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit in our lives in a way that we never thought possible? See, I believe that that can and will happen if we'll begin to pray these prayers that come straight to us from the scriptures. But you need to be warned, they are not for the faint of heart. Last week in part one of this series, we talked about one of the most dangerous yet simplest prayers that we could pray. And it's found um, in Psalm 139, where David prays a prayer that begins with two simple words, search me, search me. And we ask God to search us, not because he needs to know us. We ask him to search us so that we can know ourselves and in turn know how to become more like Jesus. And so if you missed that last week, I'd encourage you to go back, check out our YouTube channel, listen to our podcast and catch up to speed. But for today, um, we are going to take a look at a prayer that were prayed by Peter and John in the book of Acts. And if you're taking notes, maybe you want to write this down. This prayer is three simple words. Make me bold. Make me bold. Now, they pray this prayer in Acts chapter 4, where we'll get there in just a minute. But this actually begins all the way back in Acts chapter 2. And as I said, this book, it kind of tells the narrative, some of the things that are taking place. It's very storytelling in nature. If you've never read it, I'd encourage you to to definitely spend some time um, because I think what we're seeing in our society, in our culture today is we've kind of come full circle and we're getting to the point where a lot of the things that these early Christians experienced as they were establishing the church on the earth that that we're kind of getting back into those those zones and there's a lot of parallels there between the lives that they lived and the things they experienced and where we are as a church, not just Christ walk, but where we are as a church in general and where we are headed in the future as our society continues to push Christians, Christ followers, and church to the edge, okay? So, It starts in Acts chapter 2 where there's this thing that that happened. It's called the Day of Pentecost. And there were 120 um, believers in Jesus that had, um, they had gathered together in this upper room. And the Bible tells us that there's a sound of a mighty rushing wind that took place. And then um, uh, 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 tongues of of fire, uh, as a fire rested over the heads of those that were together. And that, that they began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance and that, that it prophesied to those that were around them, hearing the word of that spilled out into the streets and there were many from all over that had gathered together and they were hearing the word of God being proclaimed in their own language. And so Peter and John were among the 120 that day and so they were empowered, they were through this infilling of the Holy Spirit. And, and so shortly after that, Um, they're headed to the temple to be a part of a prayer service that is taking place. And they're planning on doing some teaching there to encourage the people that are there and point them in the direction of Jesus Christ. And as they're on their way into the temple that day, they come across this man who he's approximately 40 years old and he is lame. He can't walk. 
And so every day someone carries him and puts him down at the gate of the temple and he sits there and he begs for alms. He, he essentially, he asks people for their spare change. That's what he does. And so today is no different than any other day. And Peter and John, they're on their way to the temple. They're on their way to, to be a part of this prayer service and to, to, to teach and proclaim the gospel to those that have gathered together. And they pass by this man. And when they do, he calls out to them and he's asking them, do you have any change? Can you give me some money? And Peter and John look at him and they proclaim, they say, hey, we don't have any money, silver and gold. We, we don't have it. But what we do have we will give to you. And so they lay hands on the man and they pray for him and they help him up. And guess what? All of a sudden he's walking. He hasn't been walking for 40 years, but now he's taking his first steps. And so, so the Bible says that this man, he clings to them. Like he's so enthused that, they've, that, that through the power of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that they've healed him, that he won't let them go. And so he's following them around everywhere that they go. And so they go into the temple and it was there that Peter preaches the gospel. He proclaims the resurrection of Jesus in the temple because you need to understand that at this time there was um, there was a rift between the followers of Jesus and then the religious and and government leaders of the day the religious and government leaders of the day they wanted to make it look like Jesus had that his body had been stolen and that he wasn't really the Messiah and that he hadn't risen from the dead but people like Peter and John who were eyewitnesses to this event and they saw Jesus in person after he had risen from the dead. They, they, they're saying we can't hold back with the things that we've seen, the things that we've heard, the things that we've experienced. And so we've got to tell everybody. And so they're going to the temple and they're saying, hey, you know that man, Jesus, you saw him and he did miracles and everything. And you watched, you were the ones that had him crucified. You need to know that, that when they put him in the grave, he didn't stay there. The stone rolled away and, and he came back to life and he walked out of that grave and, and he wants you to follow after him. And here's how you can do it. Well, the officials of the day, the government officials, the religious officials, they didn't like that. And so they come and they have Peter and John arrested because of what they're doing in the temple. The religious leaders felt like they were the only ones who had the authority to teach in the temple. And they didn't like the message that Peter and John were spreading. And so they come and they have them arrested and they have them put in jail. And then the next day they have to go before these religious officials, the high priest and the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were, were a sect much like the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed that um, they, were, they were religious people and, and they were... Uh, committed to strict adherence to the law. They believed in the bodily resurrection of the dead, but they didn't believe that Jesus had been resurrected. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were um, they, they, they colluded with the Pharisees to have Jesus killed, but then after that, they went back their separate ways. And the Sadducees actually believed that there was no resurrection from the dead, Jesus or anybody for that matter. And so... Peter and John are questioned by the priests and the captain of the temple guard and by the Sadducees, and they were told to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. They were saying, you can't say these things anymore, and thus cancel culture became about, it came about, it, it began to exist. It said, you can't teach or preach, you can't make these proclamations that you're making any longer. And so, they're released, and Peter and John, they know that they've been thrown into jail for this, and they go back to the other believers at the time, and they gather together for this prayer service, and this is the prayer. If you've turned to it in Acts 4, uh, verses 29 and 30, this is the prayer that they prayed that day. Acts 4, 29 and 30. And now, O Lord, hear their threats, talking about the temple guard and the priests and the Sadducees, Hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. This is what they prayed right after they had been arrested, right after they had spent the night in jail, right after the same people that did that said, you don't need to speak of this again or we're going to put you right back here in this prison. 
They go out and they pray for great boldness in preaching the word of God. Notice what they didn't pray for. They didn't pray for safety. They didn't pray for protection. They didn't pray for comfort. They didn't say, Lord, keep us out of that jail. No, they prayed for boldness. They prayed for boldness to continue doing what got them thrown into jail in the first place. That's what they prayed for. God, this is what we need. We don't need you to keep us out of jail. We need more boldness so that we can stand in the face of this adversity and continue to proclaim what we know is the truth. See, boldness is, it's not hesitating or, or not being fearful in the face of actual or possible danger or rebuff. It is to be courageous and daring. And I believe that what we need now more than ever is an army of Christians that would stand up to be courageous and daring, regardless of what the consequences may be. See, we, here, here in America, we're, we, don't, we don't face the suffering and the persecution like our brothers and sisters and some of the other parts of the world. But I wonder, how are we going to behave? How are we going to act if and when, and I believe we're headed in that direction, when those things start to happen? We've got to be bold. Paul talks about boldness in Romans 12, verse 2, where he says, probably in a verse that many of you have heard or are familiar with, he says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, and then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So the question is, what does boldness look like? Paul says it right there. It's, it's being different. It's being set apart from the world. So like practically, what would boldness look like? Say that you wanted to be a person of boldness. Say that you were going to dare to begin to pray this prayer and ask God to make you bold. What would be some of the characteristics in your life? I have a short list. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a few things that I've put down that I think boldness might look like. Some of them are very simple. All of them are very practical. But it would be things like this. Being different or set apart from the world, being bold, I think it starts with putting your cart back in the corral at the store parking lot. <laughs> you want to be different? Like, actually take the buggy and, like, put it back into the thing instead of just leaving it in the middle of your parking space. If you're at Aldi, be really daring. Leave the quarter in it so that someone else can have it for free. Right? That's where it starts. It's just little things that we can do as believers to set ourselves apart from the rest of the world. Being bold looks like reading your Bible and spending time in prayer every single day. Every day. Being bold looks like dressing modestly. Being bold looks like tipping your servers well when you go to a restaurant. 20% or more. Being bold looks like not having a sexual relationship outside the covenant of marriage. Being bold here in 2021 looks like attending church or watching online regularly and consistently and making no excuses about doing so. Being bold looks a lot like returning the first 10% of your income as a tithe back to the Lord. Being bold, young people, looks like obeying your parents no matter what and nipping that back talk in the bud. Being bold looks like joining a life group. It looks like confessing your sins one to another so that you may be healed. It looks like sharing your faith with a neighbor or a coworker. Boldness looks like using your gifts to serve on a team at the church. Being bold looks like 
telling someone that you'll pray for them or their situation and then actually doing it, and in most cases, doing it right then. That's what being bold looks like. Being bold looks like inviting someone to church. Being bold looks like praying and then believing God to answer that prayer. Being bold looks a whole lot like just being nice to people. Because that is something that can set us apart. Letting them out in traffic. Holding the door for them. Buying the meal for the person in the drive through behind you for no other reason than to just do it. Being bold looks like standing up for what you believe, what the Bible says is true and holy and righteous, no matter the consequences. Being bold is an absolute refusal to compromise. That's what being bold looks like. But you need to be warned, living that kind of way, living that lifestyle, it's not easy. It is not easy. It's no longer the norm, and it certainly isn't popular. But it's worth it. It's worth it. So when it comes to boldness, some questions you may have. How do I get it? What does it look like? And then, what do I do with it once I have it? How do I get it? What does it look like? And then what do I do with it once I have it? And so, um, I'm gonna give you four things, a checklist of sorts on boldness that you and I can implement that comes right here from this narrative of what's going on in the lives of the early church, particularly Peter and John. When it comes to boldness, the first thing that you need to understand, that we need to understand, is that, number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Boldness is powered by the Holy Spirit. Boldness is powered by the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.31 continues our story. It says, after this prayer, where, where, where Peter and John and the other, the other disciples um, those that were gathered together, the other believers, they, they prayed for God to give them boldness to proclaim his word. The very next verse says, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. After they prayed, the place where they were shook, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then they preached the word of God with boldness. We need to know that we can't get boldness all by ourselves. There has to be a power source. And so what you and I need to do is we need to come to the throne of grace and we need to ask God, fill me one more time. I need a fresh and a new outpouring of your Holy Spirit in my life. Revive and rejuvenate and bring back to life that which has gone dead and cold. We need, to, we need to go to him every single day because we leak. We gotta go to him every single day for a new infilling of his Holy Spirit and power in our lives. The reason we gotta go every day is because we've gotta stay connected to that power source, right? We can't come unplugged. All of these electrical devices and lights and everything that we have, they look great, but they're only as good as the power source they're plugged into. We are only as bold. We're only as good as the power source we are plugged into. And the first question for tech support, troubleshooting, is the first question for Holy Ghost boldness. Is it plugged in? That's what we got to know. Are you plugged in to the power source? Because boldness is powered by the Holy Spirit. Number two, boldness provokes the enemy. Boldness provokes the enemy. You need to know that the devil does not want you to be bold. The devil wants an army of wishy-washy Christians that's what he wants. That's what he hopes. He wants to get us fighting against each other 
and failing to realize that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness. So he, he, he just wants us to, to, well, we don't want to offend anybody. Well, if we say the truth, somebody might get upset. Well, that's how he wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be bold, but when you start walking in boldness, you need to know it's going to be provoked. Uh, he's going to be provoked. He's not going to like it. Bad stuff's going to happen. Acts 5, 17 through 18, our story continues. Um, these two verses say, The high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Peter and John, they, they couldn't stop proclaiming the word of God with boldness. Remember, they, they asked God, they said, give us, give us boldness so that we can preach your word. And the, the Holy Spirit filled them. And then they went and preached the word of God with boldness. They continued to do this. And so the, the officials came back and they said, hey, we told you this one time. And so they put them, they arrested them, they put them back in jail. Now they've been in jail for two times in two days. If I went to jail two times in two days, y'all probably be looking for another pastor. These guys are like, man, they're bold. You need to know that if the devil is fighting against you, there's a pretty good chance you're probably doing something right. Pretty good chance that you are probably doing something right. But our nature, in and of ourselves, we want to avoid conflict. We want to, we want to stay away from discomfort and pain. We, we want it to be smooth sailing, right? That's how we want to experience life. But you need to know, to truly live as a Christian, it's not going to be all sunshine and rainbows. And if you've heard some other pastor tell you that in the past, they were lying to you. Living a life for Jesus Christ is not easy in this world, but it is worth it. And we can take heart because he has overcome the world. That's the promise that we have. Pastor Craig Rochelle says this. He says, if you're not ready to face opposition for God, then you're not ready to be used by God. If you're not ready to face opposition by God, then you are not ready to be used by God. Because when we step up in boldness, it's going to provoke the enemy and he will retaliate. He is going to attack us. So if the enemy's not attacking you, if life isn't difficult in some areas, that's when I'd start to get worried and start to look around a little. Because boldness is powered by the Holy Spirit. Boldness provokes the enemy. Number three, write this down. Boldness precedes miracles. Boldness precedes miracles. Acts 5, 19 and 20, it continues. It says, but they were in prison, but an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. And then he told them, go to the temple and give the people the message of life. Here are Peter and John in jail again for the second time in two days. The situation seems hopeless. It seems like the, the punishment is going to be really big this time, that now this is the second strike, and, and they've really ruffled the feathers of the religious leaders and the government officials. And they've thrown them in jail, and they're awaiting their sentence, and then in the middle of the night, an angel comes and opens the doors, lets him go and says, get back to the father's business. You need to get up to the temple and you need to keep on preaching the thing that you've been preaching. See, our situation may look impossible. The situation in front of us may seem uh, insurmountable, but you need to know that God has already made a way. They were in that jail, but God had already made a way. All he had to do was send his angels. He didn't need the key. He unlocked those doors. God has all, already made a way in our situation. And because Peter and John were willing to boldly obey, they positioned themselves to witness a miracle take place. In that instance, it was the miracle of locked doors being opened without the key. Some of us, we've got some locked doors in front of us. It seems impossible but could it be that maybe our miracle hasn't been realized? 
not because God isn't able, but because we just haven't obeyed yet? See, the thing that positioned Peter and John for their miracle was obedience. What if God's saying, I want to move in your life, but I just need you to be obedient to me? It's going to take boldness. Oftentimes, it takes boldness to be obedient to God. Maybe our miracle hasn't hasn't been realized, not because God isn't able, but because we simply haven't obeyed. Later on in Acts 5, in verses 26 through 32, Luke writes, The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles. Now, this is the third time they have been arrested in three days. Goes with the temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. I love the reply in verse 29. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him, By hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so people of Israel so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are simply witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. Boldness. Powered by the Holy Spirit, it provokes the enemy and it precedes miracles. You want to see a miracle take place in your life and your situation? Step out in bold obedience to God the Father. Surrender your life to him. Allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you and then sit back and watch what happens. Number four, boldness promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Boldness promotes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 5, 40 and 42. It says, the others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple... And from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Two times in prison, three arrests, constantly being told under no circumstances are you to continue to proclaim the message that you are proclaiming. You are not allowed to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus any longer. And they were beaten because of their continued disobedience. It says that every single day, they continued to teach and preach in the temple and from house to house. To anybody that would listen, this was their message. Jesus is the Messiah. They continued to boldly proclaim what had gotten them arrested. They continued to boldly proclaim what had gotten them thrown into prison. They continued to boldly proclaim what had gotten them beaten with rods. They continued to boldly proclaim what the government and even the religious authorities said, you can't say this any longer. They continued to proclaim it. See, boldness isn't about getting our own way. Boldness is not about serving our own agenda. Boldness is not about even drawing attention to ourselves so that everyone else thinks that we are the hero. Boldness is simply about our lives reflecting the truth of God's word and pointing other people in the direction of Jesus Christ. That's what boldness is about. So if you want to be bold because it's the cool thing to do, or you want to be bold so that everyone will turn their attention to you and say, look how great he is. Look how awesome she is. Look at all they're doing. That's not the way to go about it. 
we are bold for the sake of the gospel. And that's not about us, but that's all about the one who was sent from heaven to come and walk among us, to die on the cross and to rise from the dead on the third day so that you and I could experience everlasting life. And if I had to sum up all of this and, and, and what boldness looks like in kind of one main idea, it would be this. The call of God on your life is outside your comfort zone. That's what boldness looks like. The call of God that has been placed on your life, it is outside your comfort zone. So if you think you're fulfilling God's call in your life, but you're comfortable while doing it, he's got something bigger for you. It may be arrest, it may be prison, it may be getting beaten with rods, it may be being canceled on social media, it may mean that family members and friends turn their back and walk away from you. But God never promised that it would be easy. Boldness and the call of God that is on your life is outside the box of your comfort zone. And it's founded and it's fulfilled by boldly taking a stand and living an uncompromised life, fully surrendered to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So my question for you today Chances are you're thinking about it. Chances are the, the Holy Spirit is he's tugging at your heart right now. You already know the answer to this question before I'm going to ask it. Where's the Holy Spirit calling you to step out of your comfort zone? Where's the Holy Spirit challenging you to be more bold? Maybe it's in sharing your faith with a friend, family member, a coworker. Maybe it's being more generous with your finances, your time, your talent, your testimony. Maybe it's choosing to use your gifts, your skills, your abilities, no longer sit on those things, but, but start to serve the people around you with those gifts to make a difference in their life. I could go on and on with a big long list. Where is God? Where's the Holy Spirit pricking your heart? Where's the Holy Spirit calling you to be more bold today? For somebody, maybe it's simply to take a stand for Jesus Christ once and for all, to quit going back and forth, but to, to decide for, for finality, once and for all, that today is the day that I'm gonna put my trust and hope in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and never look back. If that's you, maybe you're watching with us online. If that's you today, I wanna invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm gonna pray and then if that's you today and you wanna step into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you wanna be bold in 2021, you wanna go against the norm of society and culture, you wanna be a true Christ follower. If that's you, would you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I'm lost without you. I believe that Jesus died in my place, making a way for us to have a relationship. And I choose to follow Jesus in his way for the rest of my life. Now for the remainder of those that have gathered here today, those that they've already put their hope, their trust in you. Lord, I pray that they would be willing to step up and step out and to become bold believers, bold followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that through the boldness of your people, Lord, that you would usher in a revival. Lord, a fresh outpouring of your Holy Ghost and power that would empower us for the challenges that lie ahead. Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength to stand firm upon the promises of the word of God and that we would operate in, in the power of God in the face of adversity. Father, I pray that in and through our boldness, 
as you fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that we would see miracles take place. Lord, that the lost would be found, that the sick would be healed, that slaves would be freed, that strongholds would be broken. In Jesus' name, God, I pray that in all things, in word, in thought, in deed, in everything that we do, that the message of God would go, the message of the gospel would go forth. That churches and individuals all over this community, all over this nation, all over this world, that they would be raised up as beacons of light, shining in the dark places that are around them and pointing people to Jesus Christ and his saving grace. God, make us bold today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and power and let us stand for you regardless of the consequences. Let that be our prayer today and always. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.